I'm going to go ahead and get started. I know a couple of y'all are still working on pizza back there. I'm not going to say anything too important here in the first couple of minutes. So thank you so much for coming. We obviously feel this is a really important discussion. You guys are ahead of a lot of your classmates in terms of thinking about what's a really critical issue in terms of preparing for the bar exam. I would say for most of our students who studied for the bar exam last year, they probably needed to have somewhere in the neighborhood of about $10,000 set aside for their bar course plus their cost of living expenses. The challenge is you cannot receive an additional loan beyond your cost of attendance or bar exam expenses. So you have to try to find that money somehow, either from within your existing loans, by saving some money, additional family support, something like that. So that's why we're talking about financial planning here. So again, federal loans only available for the cost of attendance. So if you maxed out fully your federal loans up to the cost of attendance, you have to try to find your bar money from that pool. Now, if you still have some capacity, I would say first, look for savings, and then if you have to take out additional loans to pay for bar expenses, then do that, but try to not take out any more than you have to. One of the things we talked about during the bar prep meeting last week is that having un an unsure sense of where your finances are coming from during the bar exam review period creates a risk factor for students. You don't want to have to work. You have a full-time job in terms of preparing for the bar exam. It's about a 50 to 60 hour a week job can be more intense depending upon the state that you choose to take, but we looked at Virginia, right? You got 28 subjects that you've got to master in a roughly two and a half month period. So you got a full-time job there. Adding work on top of that is going to create a risk factor for you. And when we talk about risk factor, we mean it creates a possibility that you might not be able to pass the bar. It's not a guarantee, but it's something that you don't want to have to do. You want the bar exam to be your sole focus. So beyond that, you know, we talked about $10,000, obviously a lot of money and not just the bar courses and living, just applying to take the bar, as you'll see in a couple of minutes, costs a lot of money. That varies from state to state, but you're at least talking a few hundred dollars, if not over a thousand dollars, just to apply for the bar exam and go through the character and fitness process. Private loans are not an option. What do I mean by that? So let's say you have used all of your cost of attendance, you have no additional federal loans. If you went out and you tried to seek a private loan from, say, a bank or an additional private lender, you would discover that you have a prohibitively high rate of interest associated with that loan. Somewhere in the neighborhood about 14%. Okay, you also cannot fold that loan into any of your direct loans that you receive from the federal government, meaning that that loan sits apart from all of your federal loans and is not subject to the attractive federal repayment options that those other loans are. Subject to. So again, all the more reason why you want to try to find this money from your either your existing funds. You don't want to go out and take a private loan. An institutional loan from us would constitute a private loan. We have a lower rate of interest, but we also have very limited funds that we can use for that. The rate of interest on a loan from the institution is about 6%. But again, you really don't want to do that because that loan will sit out there separate from your federal loans and it's not subject to income-based repayment, any of the loan forgiveness options you might have if you chose to go work in the public interest. So again, federal loans, if you are going to use loan money, it's still your best option. And then the time to save, obviously, is now. You can never start too early on this process, given the amount of money that we're talking about here. And we're talking about maybe potentially even over $10,000 if you have to relocate to study for the bar, if you have additional living expenses, moving expenses, all of that kind of stuff. And you're not just talking about the two and a half months while you're studying for the bar. You're actually probably talking about more like four months of expenses, right? Because nobody starts working August 1. Almost everybody starts September, if not later. So you may have additional funds that you have to find. All the more reason why you should start saving now. So let's talk about the categories of things that are typically associated with the bar exam. Okay. First of all, everybody's got to take a bar review course. right? Everybody in here should be planning to take a bar review course. should have that on the horizon. Bar application fees, this includes the character. In Virginia, as you'll see in a couple minutes, there's two separate fees. There's a bar application and there's the character and fitness process. There's a lot of variation from state to state as to how much this costs. Obviously, you gotta have somewhere to live and you gotta pay to live. So those two expense, those two things don't go away while you're studying for the bar exam. And then additional bar exam costs. Depending on where you're taking the bar exam, you may need a hotel room. You may need to fly yourself there. You may need to rent a car while you're there. I mean, so if you're studying in Lexington, you gotta take the bar in New York, you gotta get there somehow. Right, so you gotta stay there. And you, so you have to also think about how much it's gonna cost you just to take the bar exam over those two, three days in, in July. So, 
All right, let's look at Virginia as an example. Figured that this would, you know, since a lot of our students do take the Virginia bar, you may not be taking the Virginia bar, but I will say that this is not so individual as to not be helpful in terms of considering the types of expenses that you may see when you are sitting for a bar exam in another state. All right, what I've tried to do over these next few slides is to give you a sense of the range of expenses that you might be looking at in terms of the cumulative values, right? Sort of a cushion a little bit there, but you know, a high to a low value depending upon what decisions you make. So the basic Virginia application is $375. All right, that is just the application. Then there's a separate 32-page character and fitness applications where they require a lot of information from you. They require fingerprints. It's not unusual for a state to require you to fingerprint these days. So that costs $10. Driving record, if you want to request it, so that you can figure out all your moving violations in Virginia, that costs that costs eight dollars. Additional five dollars if you need certified. You're gonna have to send them your NPRE report. That's gonna be an additional twenty-five dollars. And the interesting thing about the NPRE is every time, say you're thinking about multiple bar exams, every time you do that, it's twenty-five dollars, right? Every score report, every time you request for your score to be released, every time you request for your score to be verified, they're gonna charge twenty-five dollars. That doesn't sound cheap to me. So birth certificate. I've tried to, every state's different depending obviously on where you were born. Um, so I used two examples here. If you did this in Virginia, you're going to pay about $12 to $21 if you don't have an existing copy of your birth certificate. If you did it in my home state of North Carolina, it's a little bit more expensive depending on how quickly you need it. Somewhere about 40 to 60 bucks. And then almost everyone taking the bar, not everybody, but a lot of people taking the bar these days choose to take it on a laptop. And as you might guess, there's a fee associated with that. You've got to download software, this whole deal. It's $125 in Virginia if you want to use a laptop to take the bar exam. It's not uncommon, and it's really not uncommon. That's not individual. That's not unique to Virginia. Every state where you want to take the bar exam, if you want to take it on a laptop, they are going to charge you a fee for that. Part of that is related to technical support, but part of that is just they realize that you know, it's one of those things that they are, inc they are incurring additional costs associated with your taking it on a laptop, so they pass that on to you. Then Virginia also requires a credit report. This is not uncommon either. Now, there are free credit report options. The three that they will accept are Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. If you look at these three websites, you'll realize that you could sign up for a free credit report, but seven days after you request that report, they will enroll you in a monthly service where you'll be charged $17.95 per month. Um, so you need to be on top of that. If you go with that free option, you need to make sure that you cancel and that you can cancel, right? may not be an option for you to cancel at, up until, you know, depending upon the nature of the agreement. But the general range of things is everywhere from, everywhere from zero to $15. A lot, of, a lot of bars these days in terms of the character and fitness application are requesting a copy of your credit history. They're going to want to know if you defaulted on any loans, if you've ever filed for bankruptcy, that sort of thing. So these are some of the fixed costs in terms of filling out the character and fitness application here in Virginia. And again, one of the things that we noted last, last week in the bar exam presentation is that states are not, not now asking for less information. If anything, they're asking for more information from, from candidates on the character and fitness process. So I think this is pretty representative of the, of the administrative burden you would bear and also the cost burden you would bear in terms of filling out a character and fitness application. So, all right. So housing, housing and living expenses, part of this assumes that you're going to stay here in Lexington and study for the bar exam. Okay? So you have a known universe of expenses. It's the easiest way to do this. Now, most of you guys have 12-month leases. right? You're going to be paid up through at least August 1. So it's not uncommon for students to do that. Plus, given the way that most bar review courses are structured these days, you can technically study anywhere for the bar exam. Now, part of this is you have to think about your best learning style, right? Do you need to be present where there's a live lecture? Can you watch a video? Can you be self-directed and study on your own? That is a decision only you can make. But a lot, a lot of those decisions will have implications for your cost of living expenses. You can stay here in Lexington. If that all works for you, then you may benefit. But if you have to relocate to DC, if you have to move to New York City, there, that's going to be a more expensive choice. So two different ways to look at this. So this is basically the cost of living number that is associated with our cost of attendance divided by first nine, so the nine month school calendar, or divided by 12 if you wanted to look, look at it that way. And then this is more of an anecdotal number, just knowing that students are probably paying somewhere about $500 per rent, figuring that you probably have about $200 in bills and about $100 a week on sort of living expenses. But either way, 
you need to project out at least four months of expenses when you're studying for the bar. Because, because your job, if you have a job, it's not going to start immediately after you finish the bar exam. There's typically a gap there. So at least four months, if not longer, depending upon when you're starting. This is the calculus that you need to sit down and do. And part of this involves having a monthly budget, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. But the more precise you can be here, the more helpful it will be to you. Even if you can only come to a general number, that's fine. But you need to have some sort of meaningful, realistic ballpark as to what it's going to cost you to live while, while you're studying for the bar exam. Now, sometimes people's expenses are lower, right, because you are just literally studying and, you, and your lives are less complicated than they are in school. Uh, but depending upon some of those other sort of external factors, are you relocating, are you moving, are you having to find more expensive housing in a different place, those are all things to consider. All right, so let's think about what we spent so far. All right, so you see we got a bar review course, which typically ranged from 1600 to 3800 in terms of their overall cost. So the lower end is Themis, um, which I believe is around 1600 these days. The higher end is Barbary. Kaplan is typically somewhere in between. Um, and these are variable depending upon where you choose to study. Okay, Different states cost different amounts. So Virginia typically is around $3,800 if you purchase it as a third year student. Sometimes there are discounts for students if you purchase them or you sign up with a bar review provider earlier. In addition, we have a bar application expenses, sort of the range depending upon whether or not you choose to take a laptop exam, which obviously most students do choose to take the essay portion on a laptop. And then the cost of living, you know, figuring the high amount somewhere around $1,600, the low amount based more on our anecdotal total. So we're at least looking right now, before we've actually you know, thought about any of our bar exam costs related to actually taking the bar exam on the days of the exams, we, we spent almost 7000 or 11000 bucks. All right? So, all right, so bar exam costs. So you're going to actually have to figure out how you're going to account for those days when you are taking the bar exam. Different people approach this differently. Even though you're going to be here in Lexington, Virginia, you're going to, if you take the Virginia bar, you're going to have to get to Roanoke. Are you going to drive down? Are you going to have a hotel room? Do you want to make the commute back and forth? Different people feel differently about those things. Meals, snacks, that kind of stuff. Everybody, I know this sounds very, very tedious, but if you are going to have a meaningful financial plan for in place for the bar exam, you've got to think about all these variables. So meals and snacks during the bar exam, transportation, how are you going to get there? Uh, if you're studying somewhere else, you're going to have to fly in, all of these things. So hotel room, I just did a basic search on hotels.com. A nicer hotel where you actually feel safe and, you know, I mean, where you don't feel like you're in fear of your life, right? You want to take care of yourself, have a good night's rest. You're probably looking at about $130 to $200 a night. Um, you know, mileage, if you drove to and from Lexington, you know, every day, that's something that sometimes people do, but sometimes people don't want that grind of having to make that commute. You just want it to be easy. You want to stay there in Romano. Uh, a flight, if you had to fly in from somewhere else, I know this is something that some of our students did, right? They studied for the Virginia bar elsewhere and they flew into Roanoke. We all know if you've flown out of Roanoke, it is not the cheapest bar, uh, not the cheapest airport to fly into. So, and then once you get there, you're going to have to rent a car, right? Your car is typically not waiting on you. So a car rental, I just did a basic search on a car rental for three days for the Roanoke Airport. Figure $10 per meal. One of the nice things about the Virginia bar exam, we can't do this with every bar exam uh, because we don't have the same numbers of students, but we do have a free box lunch available for students who choose to take the Virginia bar. So you know where at least one meal is coming from should you choose to take advantage of that. Uh, one of the things I will note is that there are a couple of options near the Civic Center. But those options are not really the most helpful. There's like a Sheets, there's a McDonald's there. They did have Chick-fil-A on site this past year. <coughs> yes. There's a brand new place across from Sheets, Viet Sub, that makes beautiful banh mi sandwiches. There you go. Oh, I didn't even know about that. Four bucks. I'll have to update this. I, uh, <laughs> but I will tell a little story about last, last year's exam, this past summer's exam. So, um, timing challenge. <coughs> so one of the things that really surprised me when I got down to the bar exam is that they were running over an hour behind, right? So we talked a little bit about this last week for the three L's who were, who were there. They were running over an hour behind. Well, how did they choose to handle that situation? Did they give the students an extra hour, you know, in terms of their lunch? Did, you, did they still get the same amount of time for lunch? No. They got a compressed amount of time for lunch. So where they thought they were going to have an hour and a half, next thing they knew they had like 45 minutes. Okay? So one of the problems with 
thinking like, oh, I'll just go off and get a, get a meal, is like when you only have 45 minutes, that is a pretty stressful thing to get off campus, to get back, this whole deal. So you want to try to keep your stress level as low as you possibly can. It's generally regarded as a fairly stressful experience to take the bar exam. You'll see a lot of people who are wound pretty tight that day. So you really do want to try to make this as simple as you can for yourself. So whether that means packing your lunch, having it in a cooler in your car, going out to your car and getting it, because they're really restrictive as to what you can bring into the exam itself. Uh, whether it means taking advantage of the box lunch, having somebody you know, a loved one bring you lunch, you'll see this happen quite a bit. Lots of people want to help you out when you're studying for the bar exam typically. Encourage those people's help and assistance. Take advantage of that. Uh, if somebody wants to bring you lunch both days, by all means. Uh, but also remember, there can be timing problems that can make all this stuff complicated. So depending upon what you choose to do, uh, whether you're just going to stay up here in Lexington and drive down, sort of figure that an extreme end of the cost is $2,600. Low end of the cost if you just drove down to Roanoke back and forth, it's about 110 miles collectively. You probably end up spending about 100 bucks on gas and wear and tear on your car. All right, so let's look at how much we have spent on the bar exam. So this has all, all of our costs, sort of a range here, $14,000 makes with the Cadillac of the experiences, and then $6,700 sort of being the absolute low end. Right? If you made every low cost choice here. So most students, I will say, will probably fall somewhere in between those two numbers. All right. It's obviously highly individualized. We're showing Virginia here, where you can stay in Lexington and you can study. Uh, we we'll talked a lot about if you relocated. The other thing that's going to be different for students is students choose different bar course providers. You saw there's a significant cost discrepancy between those, between the bar review companies, right? You're talking $2,200, something like that. We're going to have a bar review day, which is going to happen on October 9th, where we're going to have the three main providers that our students utilize in terms of studying for the bar exam on campus talking about their products and services uh, in the moot courtroom at lunchtime. Uh, it's going to be open to students from all three classes. I hope you guys are going to come and listen. Part of this is make being an informed consumer, right? Knowing what's best for you, your learning preferences, your learning styles, but also you know, sort of weighing these other factors and being aware of when you sign up for a particular bar company, what does that, what does that mean in terms of the services that they will be providing you, the overall cost of the services. Um, one of the reasons why we're talking about this, again, is that you have to have, you have to plan for these expenses, right? This is admittedly something that we did not do last year, and it was the one thing that I really wish we would have done in terms of talking with students and delivering programming, because it's, it's absolutely central. Um, we got to the end of the year and realized that we had students that just did not have an effective financial plan, and maybe if we would only talk to them in September or even October about this, it would have helped them at least account for some of their expenses. All right. So every, there are a lot of different ways that you can save now. And I'm going to talk through some very general ones. You guys know your situation much better than I do. Almost every time, you just type in a Google search, right? Money management, financial tips, students, moms, dads, whatever. Almost all of those tips are going to be focused on discretionary spending, right? You know, you guys have the cost of your education. You have your living expenses. Okay, those might be more, be more as fixed costs, but beyond that, you guys have a lot of, a lot of flexibility in terms of what you, what you spend and what you choose to spend. All right, so the first thing I'm going to talk about, and this is going to have some benefits for you in terms of actually establishing a financial plan for the bar exam so that you have a meaningful idea as to what it's going to cost you to live during this month, is to establish a monthly budget. How many of you guys have a budget already? Okay, good. That's great. All right, so if you don't, a very easy way to do this is to sit down. You know, we're about, we're about ready to start a new month. All right, October 1 is tomorrow. So what you would do, sit down, October 1, make it, basically resolve yourself to getting receipts for every expense that you incur that month. And then on October 31st, sit down, and you basically do a forensic analysis. You write down how you're spending that money that month. And then you look and you actually see, okay, what's necessary, maybe what's unnecessary, what can I cut, and how much am I actually spending. Before you can establish a budget, you really do need to figure out how much you're spending and how much you truly do need to afford to live here. All right, so it's a two-step process. All right? Oh, sorry, too fast. All right, now, if you read about a lot of money management, there's, there's not a lot of, there's, there's individual approaches to this. But if you read a lot of the books on saving money, one of the first things that they recommend is to try to live on 80% of your, of your monthly income. Why, why would that be? 
save the other 20? Right, you can save it. You can also make charitable donations if you want to. There's different ideas about this, but maybe you save 10%, maybe you donate 10%. The idea about a lot of this is that you don't miss money that you never had, right? So you pay yourself first, whether it's a 401k, whether it's you move it, have it moved into your savings account without you ever knowing about it, um, and you're working from a smaller amount of money, so you ensure that you're saving. Now, I know you guys, it's expensive to be a law student, I totally get that, and you're probably feeling like you don't, don't have a lot of money for this, but hopefully as we go through the next slides, maybe, maybe these will sort of spur you to think like, gosh, I wonder if that expense is totally necessary. So let's, let's imagine that you, you, you are basically making in terms of your overall, overall cost of, of living, $1,600 a month, right? So that was the figure that's gonna cost to live here based upon our cost of attendance projection, um, divided by nine. Now, if we said we're gonna live on 80% of this, that drops that figure to $1,300, which, you know, if, if you are in that category of people who are paying about $500 a month for rent or $600, still leaves you 700 bucks for your other expenses. You might be able to get by on that in Lexington, Virginia. If you were able to do this, look at how much you would be saving though. Right, it's over $2,000. Right, just straight off the top before you've actually touched anything. Right, that's at least a th almost a third of that low end of the bar exam cost. Right, we talked about the low end of that being about $6,700. You would have saved almost a third of that uh, by simply making this one choice. The whole key with this, though, is you have to pay yourself first. This cannot be an end of the month thing, right? And it's even better if you automate it, right? Because you never, you, again, you never miss money that you never knew you had, right? So it would go into a savings account, something like that, just to set aside. All right, the, the way I calculate also that figure is that we assume that we have seven months between now and, and the bar exam time period, right? April, April, end of April, May or so. For those of you who are in your second year, you got, the great thing is you guys have even more time than this. So think about if you were able to do this starting now. Now, even, now let's imagine you can't get to 80%, but you could even get to something like 90%. That's still incredibly helpful. Like every little bit along the way here will start will help you develop something of a nest egg to address your bar exam expenses. So again. One of the things that people talk about a lot in terms of saving money is discretionary purchases. Things that you don't necessarily have to buy, right? You guys, you know, and even within things that you have to buy, right, you have to eat, you do have some flexibility as to whether you choose to eat at Southern Inn every night or whether you choose to cook at home, okay? All right, so a couple basic strategies. All right, so write a list before you go shopping. How many of you guys go to the grocery store with a list? All right, great. Right, because the idea is you then have a universe of things that you know that you need, and you're not going to vary from that. Right? It's going to cut down on your impulse purchases. Some people actually recommend that if you pick something up and it's not on your list, wait 10 seconds. Decide whether to put it in your cart. Because at that point, you'll hopefully resolve whether or not it's actually needed. So a 30-day rule on any unnecessary purchases. So what if, you know, we've all been on the internet. Amazon or something like that, and you get this wild hair about something that you feel like you need and you want to buy it. So a lot of money management folks talk about stepping back from that transaction, let it, let it percolate for a, for a few weeks, and come back to it. If you still feel that you need it, then, then buy it. But most people, when they withdraw from that and they st step back, find that, that that immediate pressure that they felt to purchase that item is no longer there. So that, that's something to think about. Obviously. Do things at home instead of going out. It doesn't mean that you have to be a recluse. But say you replaced you know, a, a meal out with entertaining at home, certainly one of those things that could helpful, be helpful. Hide your credit cards. There are a lot of people who are pretty extreme about this and talk about if you have credit card issues, uh, freezing your credit cards in the freezer. And so that they're literally in a block of ice that they cannot be used. All right? So I'm, I'm providing you with information. You guys have to make the choices yourself. And then switch to cash. Um, now, I will, I will say this. I was at Pure Eats this Saturday afternoon having a hamburger, and their credit card machine was down, and like literally people, every, everybody walked in and walked immediately right back out. Okay, so I understand that, and there's a lot of commercials, the Starbucks commercial about, or like I guess it's a debit card commercial about people just going through this coffee shop just repeatedly, and then like the one person brings out cash. People are like, oh, this person. <laughs> right, so I guess cash is the new check writing, right? So, but there's a psychological value to switching to cash, 
All right, and you feel like you're spending money, right? You don't feel like you're spending money when you're just swiping stuff, all right? Another suggestion that you oftentimes see online is take all of your credit card information out of like your Amazons, your places where you make repeated purchases, actually have to manually enter that stuff because that makes it real for you that you're actually spending money. All right, what you're trying to do is get to a point where you appreciate the fact that this is actually costing you something. So uh, buy generic, use coupons, maybe you guys are already clipping coupons, there are lots of websites where you can get them. Bring your lunch, we'll talk a little bit in more detail about how much money you can save from that. Cancel your subscriptions, you know, if you guys are, if you're really trying to find money, I know that sounds impossible, right? No cable, no Netflix, no magazine subscriptions, but it is an additional source of significant savings if you are trying to find, find something. Um, use the library, how many of you guys have ever checked out a DVD from our university library? All right. Okay. I want you to do this. If you do nothing else, walk over there and just look at the number of DVDs that they have. All right. They have a tremendous number of movies. So does our Rock Ridge Regional Library, the local library, which will cost you a dollar to get you, get a get a library card. You know, instead of buying that book, go to the library, check it out. They have. I can tell you, I've never had a problem finding a book over there that I was. I don't think anybody uses the library, but uh, <laughs> so clearly by the hands that went up. Uh, and then I've always been somewhat impressed and also a little bit concerned about the, the spring breaks that people take here. <laughs> I want you guys, we're going to do a sort of analysis on how much a latte costs when it's, when it's purchased with loaned money. I want you guys to think about the spring break trips when, when we go through that. Okay? So these are just some suggestions as to how you can limit discretionary, discretionary spending. All right. Okay. All right. All right, so let's imagine that I go out for a latte every day to start the day. All right, I figured that $4, you know, surveying the different coffee shops here in town was about an average price, right? Now, it's not even like I'm not even doing anything exotic with that. I'm just buying a latte. So my total cost per week is 28 bucks. That didn't seem so bad. You know, what's $28? Over a month, 112 Over seven months between now and the bar exam, 784 but you always got to think about alternatives, right? So the alternative here is that if I just actually bothered to purchase a pound of coffee at the grocery store, it's about 10 bucks. Even if I got like the high end stuff, like I wanted to drink Starbucks, um, you get about 40 cups of coffee per one pound bag. All right, you guys are well since you can do the math on that. That's 25 cents per cup. All right, that's a significant difference, right? That's at least three dollars and 75 cents every time I choose to drink coffee. All right, now even if I had to buy a coffee maker, that's like a $40 expense, still a lot cheaper, right, than that. So total savings per week, and then over seven months, it's over $700. So you're just looking for a way that you can start generating some additional income for yourself. This kind of stuff is very easy to do, right? I mean, it's not like I didn't say, don't have coffee anymore. It's just you replace it with a less, less cost, cost uh, less expensive, Alternative. All right. Okay. So, if I was living on 80% of my expenses and I started brewing my own coffee, this is exactly how much money I will have saved up between now and the bar exam. Okay. All right. So I'm over three thousand dollars right now. Now let's take a slight diversion here. Now, student loan money for discretionary purchases. Now I understand that you know it seems like loans are invariably a part of going to law school. I get that. But you got to think about the overall cost of this individual purchase, right? And I'll use a latte because it's not a necessary purchase, okay? It's not like your textbooks or something like that, all right? So, you're paying, an, when you take out loan money, you guys all know this, you're paying for a certain, you're paying for the privilege, it may not be the right word, um, but in terms of using money now that you will have later, that's associated with the cost, right? That's where your interest comes from. All right, now let's think about this. How much does this latte really cost me? All right, now let's just say I'm, I'm paying with loan money. There's a lot of numbers up here, but I want you to focus on a couple of them. So the daily cost, again, not so bad. I do this every, every day for a week. My total cost per year is 1,400 bucks, okay? Over three years, about $4,300. Still not, doesn't seem like a, I mean, it's like years, a couple years worth of expenses. Guys, I want you to look here at the bottom. All right? 
All right, and again, this is a really aggressive repayment schedule. This is a 10-year repayment schedule, right? A lot of people have 20-year repayment schedules. All right, so the cost per latte is actually $7.11. All right, see that now $3 is pure interest on that latte. And this is at a 5 or 6% rate, annual rate, over 120 payment schedule, so a 10-year repayment schedule. Um, so if I actually extended this and made it a 20-year repayment schedule, this then becomes over this then becomes over nine dollars, right? So I'm now paying more in interest than I was actually paying for the latte in the first place. So you just think about that. I think I think that makes it a little bit more real for you as to why some of these just even simple cost-affecting choices will help save you some money. Any any questions before I move on? Okay. All right. Now, I decided to bring my lunch. All right. They, this is like these are like the greatest hits of cost saving. Right. This is not original. This is not original in any way. I'm not telling you anything too profound. But part of this is to help make it seem real to you how you can save money here. All right. So, if I ate, you know, sort of one of your local restaurants here, you go get a sandwich, that sort of thing. You're probably looking at about ten bucks if I eat here on campus. You know, the dining halls about eight, if I ate down at three stop, probably about eight bucks. If I brought my lunch, four dollars is actually a pretty high estimate as to what that's going to cost you, but I was trying to be generous and say that you had fancy tastes and you wanted to eat something pretty nice. So, so if I started bringing my lunch, all right, so I would save somewhere in the neighborhood of about 42 bucks, this assumes that I eat out every day versus bringing my lunch, right? So the difference there between those two things, over, over a month, 168 bucks over seven months, over a thousand. All right. So I'm. I, this is. This is. I'm still eating. I'm still eating pretty well. You know, four bucks is a lot of money. Um, but if I only made one, like let's say, I, like I cannot imagine personally not eating lunch out six days a week or something like that. Right. Even if you made that one one change, just one day a week, you would at least pay for one night at a ho at a hotel room. Study for the bar exam. It's simple to imagine if you did that for two days, you'd pay for all of your hotel room in, in Roanoke. So, if you start thinking about these in equivalent things, like one of the basic sort of money management ideas is that you think about the actual work cost of the items that you're purchasing. You know, that not, might not necessarily be completely applicable for where you are in your life, but if you think about the number of hours you have to work for, to pay for that item, right, or the relative cost of that item. That's one of the ways that you can start to arrive at this whole calculus of whether or not it's worth it. So the easy example is a $50 pair of shoes if you earn 10 bucks an hour, right? That's your, that's your net, that's your net take home pay. Is that worth five hours of work to you? Just to sort of help you think, think through it. All right, so let's sort of take a tab on where, where I am in terms of my savings. All right, so again, I found a way to live on 80% of my expenses, brewing my own coffee, now bringing my lunch every day. I'm over $4,000 at this point. Okay, so again, I'm closing in on at least that lower end figure. All right, so this is one that's pretty easy to pick on. All right, the other thing that people say is that bringing your, in, in addition to bringing your lunch is eat at home. All right, how many of you guys have a crock pot? You guys have a crock pot? All right, that's like, that's like the number one example of the cheapest meals that you can make, right? Because like you just put a whole bunch of stuff in there, you like leave it for a while, you come back, you like, and then you like have leftovers for a couple days. So your cost per serving is quite low on a crock pot meal. It's not so low when you go out to eat um, here at one of your nicer restaurants in town. This is a cost for one person to eat at like the Southern Inn or Bistro or Bricks. I sort of try to like take a survey. The other, the other meal that people always point to is like a really cheap cost per serving meal is casseroles. If you guys ever feel like making casseroles, that's the one that comes up a lot. So if I ate at home, right, eight bucks for a meal at home relative to uh, one of your restaurants in town, that's a lot of money uh, relative to what it typically costs to eat at home uh, per meal. But I was, try I was trying to be generous so you guys wouldn't think I was lowballing on these, uh, on these figures. So the total savings per week, if I only just replace that one meal, would be twenty-two dollars, okay? Over, you know, say I ate, you know, I just replaced one one meal that I ate out every week at, at one of our local restaurants with eating at home, and I did that every week, eighty-eight bucks, and then over seven months, over six hundred dollars. Now, where this really gets kind of, 
I thought surprising when I started going through this is if I ate multiple ate those ate those kind of meals multiple times, right? If I went to this, if I went out to one of our nicer restaurants like three, four times a week, right? If I was getting take home meals or to go meals. Um, when you start doing the math on this and multiplying it out, like if you replace two meals, three meals, it starts getting, I mean, the savings are fairly impressive, right? It's $1,200, $1,800, $2,400. $2, so if you're looking for additional ways to save, just adjusting some of your habits with respect to your meals, very easy thing to do, bringing your lunch, eating at home more often, instead of having your friends go out. I mean, when you go out to eat at a restaurant, you're paying for a lot of things. You're paying for that person's salary, whatever they're making, you're paying for the other people that are working there, they're going to make a profit, you're not concerned with the profit when you're cooking at home, you're just cooking. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that goes into that, that you're paying for. You're paying for their fixtures, you're paying for the cost of keeping the lights on, the water running, the facility, I mean, all this is factored in. You talk to anybody who's ever done sort of price generator for a restaurant, there's a lot of stuff that's factored into that individual meal that you're not paying for when you're cooking at home. Right, and even this goes down to your entertainment dollar. Right, going out, having drinks with friends, whatever you guys do to socialize. If you actually do that at somebody's house instead of going out, if you think about how much that one beer costs you, right? You buy a six pack or something like that relative to what it's going to cost you to buy one beer. I mean, typically, the, you guys can all understand that the calculus there is that you're saving quite a bit of money. So, it's not to say that you have to be a hermit or shut in. But if you're looking for ways that, that you can save additional money for the bar exam and, and to accrue savings while you're here, these are some very easy things to identify. And a lot of people particularly focus on the decisions we make relative to entertainment and our entertainment dollar in addition to discretionary spending. Because these, it's not like, and, it's, and the reason why these are easy to pick on is that you have a very easy, easily identifiable cost alternative, low cost alternative. All right, so let's see, now that I've made, made this change, where I am. So with all of this, you start to sort of add it together. I'm now at almost $5,000, at 4800 bucks, right? And I'm still, I'm still living pretty well, right? I'm doing pretty good for myself. So, all right, how many of you guys drive to school? Okay, all right. So I'm going to make a pitch for walking to school, all right, because you're not spending any money on gas, you're also not putting any mileage on your car, no wear and tear on your vehicle, right? You're going to service it a lot less, you're going to buy a lot less gas, and most of you guys live probably within a 10 minute walk, 10, 15 minute walk. There's also a health benefit here, all right? So let's just focus on, if I bought one tank of gas, and gas is still pretty cheap right now, but we all, all remember it was like 4.30 a gallon or something like that a, few, a couple of Labor Days ago. Um, it's around three, three dollars, three dollars and ten cents right now. Um, but I'm saving at least forty bucks. I, I drive a Volkswagen Jetta, a twelve-gallon tank, a little bit more than that. So it's about forty dollars for me to gas up. And if you really wanted to figure out the savings relative to driving, basically, for me that would be I'm driving about two hundred and forty miles less in a given week than I would normally. You put that in sort of a wear and tear calculator. It's a lot more than forty bucks, right? Because that means. I now don't have to worry about my car breaking down for you know as, quite as quickly as it would. Um, so total savings it's very easy to calculate. It's only two hundred. It's only two hundred eighty dollars, but that's like just base minimums. If I started walking everywhere, then all of a sudden I may be even saving more money than that. And again, that's a very conservative estimate because it doesn't take into account wear and tear. So I'm now over five thousand dollars. And I feel like I'm doing probably pretty well for myself because I'm still eating, right? I haven't cut out a meal or anything like that. I didn't say like, well, I'm not going to eat breakfast anymore. Um, I'm still eating. I'm still living. Um, I'm still doing things that I enjoy. And now I probably feel a little bit better for my, about myself because I'm walking everywhere that I go, right? I'm, I'm getting my exercise in. All right. Now, this is probably the one that you guys are going to look at and think like absolutely impossible. Can't do it. Um, okay, I, under I understand that, right? But there, there, are, there are opportunity costs relative to every, every economic decision that we make. Um, and again, this is if you are trying to find additional sources of, of, of savings within your existing cost, within your existing expenses, right? Say you have taken the full amount of your loans, you don't have additional funding through there, what can you cut? Cable bill is a very easy thing to cut, 
right? Because not only do you have DVDs and TV shows that you can watch from your local libraries here that you can check out, you could also watch things for free on the internet. You all have the internet for free here at school. You know, and so there's different ways that you can go about this. Um, but you see, if I cut my cable bill, which all I have is really fairly basic cable, which keeps getting more expensive, but it's 600 bucks. All right, now that's not even like some complicated, I don't have any premium channels. If you can't cut cable, maybe you can cut your premium channels. If you can't cut cable, but you have Netflix, maybe you can cut off Netflix. There are a lot of different ways you can go on this. But again, you gotta think about if you're looking for savings, where can you find them? And do you have an e do you have a low cost alternative available to you? Most people would argue that relative to cable, you actually do have some low cost alternatives that would keep you entertained and that you should consider taking advantage of them. And the other thing that people always pick on is like magazine subscriptions and things like that. Those aren't really essential. You know, they get you in for like nine ninety five, but then it becomes like thirty five, forty bucks. You know, and now granted, that may be per month, it may be per year. It's going to depend upon the nature of the magazine subscription. But again, you, if you cut that off, you can check out magazines here. You also check out magazines across campus and at the local library. And I can tell you, how many people do you know that have ever che checked out a magazine from a library? Nobody ever checks them out. You would never have a problem getting the most recent issue. <laughs> so I will say, you do have some op opportunities there. So all right, let's see how much I've saved so far. I canceled my cable, which was painful but necessary. Um, <laughs> So I'm now at 5,700 bucks, all right? Just by some, some, just basic choices, right? I haven't done anything elaborate. I've, and I've not made a plasma donation yet or anything like that. So, <laughs> so all right. Now let's compare that to what I, I said the bar exam was gonna cost me. And again, and I said that most students are probably looking at somewhere around $10,000. 10000 dollars We took an average of what students were experiencing, or maybe even closer to a median of what students were experiencing last summer. Probably somewhere between these two numbers, right? And if I assume that, that I would be between those two numbers at about ten thousand dollars, if I'm thinking about four months of expenses, a bar review course, living while I'm studying for the bar exam, just by making those simple behavioral changes, I'm over fifty-five percent of the way there. Right? And that's if I just started doing that now as a third year student. Right? What's the great thing about it if you started doing it now as a second year student? You just saved all your money. Right? You would be there by the time the bar exam rolled around. Right? And that's just by making a few simple choices. Um, so I would have actually more money because I would probably be closer to about eleven or twelve thousand dollars because I would have nineteen total months to save. Right? The other thing is for you second years, probably thinking about summer funding. Where is that going to come from if you're in an unpaid position? This is relevant for that too, right? All of these things can be helpful if you're looking for additional sources of sources of income. All right, yes, Ash. I have a question. Okay, so if you if you're already doing public interest work mm -hmm. and you're you're already cutting costs and mm -hmm. you've gotten a job to save money mm -hmm. for your summer and then you already don't have cable, mm -hmm. you're not getting out doing yes. other things, and you you still are struggling to find funds, what do you do in that case? Well, a couple things. Um, have you, you have a budget? Yeah. Work off of? All right. The only thing I would tell you then to do is, is a expense audit. To actually sit down and look at your expenses and see where they're going. If at that point that's what it, it, it you don't have any, any room, then that's one of those things that, you know, at least you now know what you're working from. But I think the first thing I would tell you to do in that is to give yourself a month and then to sit down and do an expense audit. Because I think almost all of us, if we were to do that, there would be opportunities for us to make different decisions with how we're spending the money. That's not, it's hard to generalize on that, but that, was the, that would be the first place to go. Um, I'd be happy to sit down and look at that with you if, if you want to. I, also, there are books and resources that, that I would also recommend too. Yeah, Angela. Yeah, just piggyback on what Ashley said. Is there any way that we could, I guess, adjust our living expenses for next year? Because they went down from mm -hmm. last year. Yeah. And people have gotten, to, have gotten jobs to be able to yeah. subsidize that and all the things like that. So what, you know what I'm Yeah. <laughs> it's okay, so, I understand, so it's a real thing. what can we do to get more money? If you guys don't feel, I mean, so I will tell you why they were adjusted down. It felt like that the the allocation was overly generous, right? It felt like it was, it was over $16,000 to live in, in, in Lexington, Virginia. It, felt like it was out of step with what students were actually spending. If you don't feel like that's realistic, then send me an email. Um, if you can actually give me some sense of what you're actually spending per month, 
send, send me an email so that I'll, I'll be happy to take it up with the dean. Uh, but if we looked at what we were saying students would actually have to spend relative to what schools who were located in other areas where it was much more expensive to live were saying that students should have for the cost of living. And we were well beyond that, which did make a lot of sense in Lexington, Virginia. I mean, I think, I think we were actually outpacing schools in D.C. in terms of cost of living. So now that you have less money, I, I would recommend anybody who's trying to look for additional savings to start with a, like sort of a forensic analysis of their expenses. Set one month as your sort of like your zero point, right? This is I'm going to see just what I'm spending and then moving forward. If you cannot find additional savings by doing that, um, follow up with me and I'd be happy to sit down with you and think of some things. Uh, but you can find a lot of this information just by doing basic Google searches. Um, but also if you feel that it's too low, like you can actually not live under the amount that, that is being recommended as being provided for cost of living expenses, then please send me an email. And I think one thing that's it. hard is that the school expects us to live off of nine months, but all of our leases are 12 months. Mm -hmm. Well, at least 95% of our leases yeah. are 12 months. Yes. So. No, I understand that. Sort of one of the reasons why I thought it would be good for two else to come to this conversation today, um, in terms of thinking about how you. I mean, there's a lot of things that you got to do financially. I understand that, and it's sort of it's stressful to think about. I absolutely understand. But even a, any amount of savings, even if so, if you say you have a 12, 12 month lease and your rents on the high end, right, nine hundred bucks or something like that. If you break that down in terms of per month, what you need to save in terms of covering that over the summer, right? You got not, you got to save three hundred dollars for each month that you're in school, right? To get to the $2,700 value that you have to have to support, to support your rent payment during the summer. I know, that's, I know that's hard to think about where that's gonna come from. If you could get yourself to a point where you're actually living on less, like if, for example, we did that 80% calculation, you, are, you would have already covered that $2,700, right? I know based upon the, the comments that we received, I understand that may be hard to think about, but again, you, you'll find this, it's like we talked a lot in time management about your, your time adjusts the amount of time that you give a task. You really, if you could get to the point where you can adjust your living expenses so that they are, are lower, right? You don't miss money that you never had, right? If you could take 10 or 20% off, off the top and put it into savings immediately, you would find that sometimes your expenses adjust, adjust to that. But that may not be an easy decision for everybody else to make, I, everybody to make. I, I totally understand. It's just one suggestion. But you would have found your rent money if you had a $900 a month rent, which strikes me as is high for a lot of our students. Yes, Matthew? If you are able to save each year mm -hmm. uh, for us not taking out the loans mm -hmm. for school, are those loans from your previous years accessible? Are they not? No. You to get it each year. Yeah, it's, it's relative to your cost of attendance in that given year. So, okay. um, so the maximum amount of loans that you could take out here would be about $62,000 in a given academic year, uh, if you, which is tuition plus fees plus cost of living. Okay. So the amount that actually costs for you to be a student here based upon the, but based upon the information we provide. Yes, Will? For two L's worried about summer rent. Um, every year there are three L's who, I don't know if this is true like for everybody's landlord, but I know my landlord because we've been there for the first two years of law school, without us even asking, said I'm, I'm changing your lease to end in May of the third year because we've given her, you know, almost, you know, instead of 36 months, it'll turn out to be 30, 33 months. No, not a lot of skin off her back. Uh, she's okay. gonna wanna be turning that over in the summer anyway for right having people. So a lot of people might be flexible with you about shortening your lease on the, on the back end. And then for those three L's who've done that already, we're looking for a place to study for the bar exam yeah. in Lexington while you guys are out at your summer jobs. And so I know a lot of people who sub like last job in the summer who sublet in their apartments as two L or rise, right? Two L's, right? <laughs> who sublet their apartment to graduating three L so that they can study for the bar exam in Lexington. Yeah, you may notice that a lot of our three L's don't seem to have a place that they permanently live here in Lexington. So that will, uh, certainly along with what Will said just then, they'll be looking for a place that they're studying for the bar exam here to, sub, to sublet. Um, and I think that's a, that's a really good point. We also have other people that are coming to the area for whatever reason to, to live here in Lexington to study for the bar exam that are looking for a place to live. So there are additional people who could come and sublet your apartment. Um, sometimes they run in law notices. I mean, if you're looking for somebody to sublet your apartment, I would say you know February, March, start running a law notice. 
it, it wouldn't hurt, right? You never know until you ask, as they say. So that's one way of helping you defray some of those costs. But I'm happy to meet with anybody to talk through some of these issues. I know you guys have highly individualized financial situations. It's very generalized information. It's intended to be thought-provoking, if anything. Right? That's really where I'm coming from. I'm not, not saying, I'm not mandating any of this stuff. It's just intended to encourage reflection. Right? So I, and I understand that some of this may seem very difficult. And, it, and I, I, this is really coming from a place of just trying to help people think, sort of, if you can take a step back from your expenses and sort of reflect on what might be helpful in terms of saving money. Um, and I know that's hard to imagine, but just even giving yourself some context and perspective on your expenses. It's good for ev all of us to do. I was talking with some of my colleagues this morning. And everybody, when you start really thinking about some of these things, you almost invariably do think about things that you do that you could do differently, that you could save some money with. Um, and that's, that's, something, that's something that I think we could all benefit from. Other questions that I can answer? Yeah. <clears throat> there are still some work study and research assistant positions open as well. And so one thing I would say, in addition to budgeting your money, you, you really want to look hard at budgeting your time and see if you don't have a way to hard out 10 hours a week to do some research assistance work. I mean, I know it's hard, you know, yeah. it, it's not ideal, but... Yeah, I, well, that was, that was yeah, one thing I was thinking about as well, like federal works, this past summer I did it, but then it's like they take some of that money, portion of that money from your living expenses for the, for the next year, so it's like you're trying to hook yourself for the summer and then you're damaging yourself for the next year, yeah. so you're constantly being it, below um, what you have. It, well, there's, there's benefits though, I mean that's just one way to look at it, but the, the idea is you're not, so it reduces your loan eligibility, but that's also not money that has an interest payment associated with it, right? Right, so you, it, you have three thousand dollars that they pull aside. If you work and you earn that money back, that's it's it's treated differently than the money that you actually take out through your loan. So there is a benefit, but I also understand that it does reduce your overall loan eligibility. So it is something to think about. Um, but you got to work also. You got to work your hours, though. That's the other thing. Like the worst of all possible things is to sign up for a work study, have your federal loan eligibility reduced, and then not work it, not work at all if you feel like you actually need that money. So you're gonna have to put the time in to actually get that money back out. Um, so, but that's another option. I know we still have positions here within the law school that are not that are not filled. If you guys are looking, you no, know, a couple people are now working for dining services. I think you get a free meal plan if you, if you do that. Um, it's a good deal, and they seem to be fairly flexible in terms of working with students. Every time I go over to the marketplace, there's either students working or Cafe 77 students working, so that's another option that you have um, if you're looking for. I mean, that would at least take care of your meals, right? All of a sudden, you know where those are coming. It doesn't cost anything either. Um, you know, you're just making money there. And then if you can sort of stack that and you think, oh, gosh, I'm save, I am save additional money because you have a job, that's a great thing. Yeah, Kim. Do you know a plasma donation center close to the Roanoke? No, I, I unfortunately do not. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, that was, uh, I did not include that slide in my presentation. So um, just a couple things. So again, just to reiterate, ways that you can eliminate some discretionary expenses or replace them with lower cost alternatives. Um, and just to highlight other, other programs that we have coming up. So one of the really important things about I know there's about a class that's about to come in here. One of the really important things is not only saving money while you're here, but being aware of the repayment options that are available to you as a graduate working to service the loan debt that you have. This is actually a fairly complicated landscape these days. There are a lot of great programs, but you've got to make sure that you get in the right program. Right? So it's knowing what's out there, knowing what you qualify for, and signing up and actually taking the necessary administrative steps to get in the right program. The good thing for you guys is that we're going to have a student loan expert, Heather Jarvis. She was here last year. She's coming back. Please tell all your friends to go to this. Everybody thinks I'm only eligible for you know, income-based repayment if I'm working in the public interest. That is not true. That is not true. There are, there are attractive programs for people who even are not working in the public interest. Okay. So it's not just for people who are working in public interest. There are great programs if you're working in public interest, but there is, a, there is a lot of misinformation in this area, and she will help to dispel some of those myths. She'll be here October 24th. And this is some of our upcoming programming that we have relative to the bar exam. Um, third year is obviously encouraged to attend, but second year, so it's never too early to start learning about it. The next thing we'll have is the bar review day that I mentioned. That'll be in the Moot Courtroom at noon on the 9th, where we'll have Kaplan, Themis, and Barbary here to talk about the different services and products they provide. Um, any additional questions? All right, well, thank you all for coming. I hope this was helpful.